Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from a book titled Designs of Destruction, The Making of Monuments in the 20th Century by Lucia Ale, published by the University of Chicago Press. In 1937, the American historian Louis Manford pronounced the death of the monument in a transient attempt to settle a question that had vexed architects and critics for almost a decade. Could a monument be modern? Manford answered no and pointed to memorials that had been built across Europe and North America since the mid-1800s. To Manford and others, the monument simply seemed an obsolete building type, fixed in an era of mobility, permanent in a time of technological change, and singular in a democratic age. The very idea of a modern monument, Manford concluded, is a contradiction in terms. This book is about an architectural phenomenon that proved Manford's pronouncement wrong, upsetting every assumption on which he based his hard line between the monument and modernity. Foremost among these was the assumption that new monuments would be built from scratch. Think of buildings that count as monuments today. There are newly built ones, uh, such as the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, an undulating grid of concrete blocks designed by the American architect Peter Eisenman in Berlin in 2005 to commemorate the Holocaust. But there are also ready-made ones, uh, such as the Maison des Esclaves, an 18th century slave owner's house in Gore, Senegal, where the US President Barack Obama paid a state visit in 2013 or the ancient Roman amphitheater in Palmyra, Syria, a semicircular stage where a jihadi organization filmed beheadings after destroying the nearby arch in 2015, and where the Russian military who then occupied the region held a triumphant concert. Just because these last three house theater, arch, have existed in some form for hundreds or thousands of years, does not mean that they are not modern too. They contain a hefty percentage of metal, epoxy, asphalt and concrete. They accrue more significance every time a political leader stops by. The thousands of yearly visitors they attract are motivated not by a cult of death or personality, but a cult of architectural heritage itself, which is fully enmeshed with contemporary local and global politics. By the contradictory standards Manford laid out, these are modern monuments. Their job is survival, and their survival requires precisely the kinds of techniques he identified as engines of modern life. The 20th century turned out to be the most destructive in human history. Between 1914 and 1970 especially, physical damage to the built environment was enlarged, dispersed and routinized so far and wide that it became a new architectural category in the public imagination, an unavoidable datum of global historical thought. Already at the time of Manford's writing, an accelerating pace of man-made catastrophes in Europe, Africa, Asia and the Middle East had washed a sinister tint over progressive and imperial narratives of human betterment. Over the course of the next three decades, as tens of millions of lives were upended by mass death and mass displacement, landscapes of destruction came to be read as emblems of deep historical tragedy. Amid this real and imagined tabula rasa, not only did monuments live on. A monument became redefined as any architectural object whose modernity lies not in its style or form, but in its capacity to survive destruction. This global redistribution of significance was informed by efficacy as much as re-evaluation. In order to survive, monuments required new classifications paperwork, information exchanges, as well as new methods for manipulating visual and architectural form. Monument survival itself became a branch of international diplomacy. This book then addresses the remarkable return of the monument to the world stage by following a movement of internationalists who mobilized in the middle of the 20th century to design the survival of a vast array of architectural monuments. 
These were bureaucrats, intellectuals, art historians, archaeologists, curators, lawyers and architects. They profess a no less lofty a spiritual creed than Manfort and likewise claimed to act on a cogent diagnosis of Western civilization's deepest impulses. But, rather than await an organic renewal of the built environment, they set out to mitigate its impending erasure by activating a persuasive channel of modern power, bureaucratic organization. If destruction was to be systemic, so too would architectural survival need to be rationalized through administration, paperwork and pragmatics. Thus, this movement first sought a platform in the new diplomacy of the League of Nations, an institution created in 1919 to regularize and bureaucratize international relations. Beginning as a small committee in Geneva and spreading increasingly wide, they worked to transform thousands of objects once known as artistic or historic monuments into a new kind of international marker, designated as cultural and later world heritage site. Monument survival, as this book defines it, is the species of international design by committee that they invented. The movement coalesced at the first ever diplomatic event devoted to monuments, the 1931 Athens Conference, and worked throughout the 1930s on a transnational blueprint to protect monuments. After war broke out in 1939, the group developed a branch in the Allied military government, producing lists and maps of protected monuments and perfecting formats of architectural information to suit the visual and epistemic needs of the military. These documentary procedures became normalized after the war, as monuments advocates established a foothold in the Cultural Agency of the United Nations, UNESCO. In the 1950s and 1960s, all manners of monument maintenance and preservation were quietly incorporated into international schemes for economic and urban planning, infrastructural development and nation building. By the late 1960s, this multilayered expertise machine was called upon to perform new narratives of cultural cooperation, leveraging the spectacular aspects of technology at various monumental sites. These efforts culminated in 1972 with the signing of the World Heritage Convention, the first international legal instrument devoted to maintaining the modern world as a place of monuments survival. So self-evident had this idea become that the convention took monuments as legal basis for a global imperative of environmental survival as well. The narrative arc of the book is anchored by these two dates. 1931 and 1972. In the 19th century, historic preservation began to progress hand in hand with mechanical reproduction in the visual arts, even as monumental heritage was widely used by late imperial and national governments in their invention of traditions. This book contributes to this broad historical panorama by locating architecture in the international dynamics of heritage modernization during a mid-20th century period when this dynamic was determined overwhelmingly by the pairing of destruction and mass media. The committees in this book were all conceived as part of an effort to incorporate media or publicity in international relations, whether through intellectual cooperation in the 1930s, morale during World War II, or the minds of men with UNESCO in the post-war. At first, their primary tool for the internationalization of monuments was the list, descended from many other bureaucratic instruments, laws, inventories, charters, edicts, declarations that had been used to theater monuments to governments since the French Revolution. But eventually they came to involve increasing architectural expertise, management and design. Still today, world heritage is primarily a list, but, as any group who agitates for inscription can attest, listing is not the beginning, but an end of monumental politics, the result of numerous spatial and architectural transformations for certain objects to meet certain criteria. The book, therefore, focuses on the period before the World Heritage Convention was signed, in the momentous decades when its principles were worked out on the ground. 
Many of the buildings in this book were already famous monuments by the time international experts visited them. The Parthenon, the temples of Abu Simbel, the Cathedral of St. Lo, the Bamiyan Buddhas, to name but a few. But innumerable others were local landmarks, thrust into global visibility. The new glue that came to hold politics and architecture together at all these sites was culture, an international category whose invisibility and apparent self-evidence was precisely its strength. In contrast to other contemporaneous definitions of culture as either lived experience or high art, culture in the international liberal political system was a middling consensus-building substance that could therefore be attached to inanimate objects. Cultural monuments, cultural sites, cultural heritage, cultural property, cultural institutions, cultural affairs. One of the goals of this book is to show the wide variety of state-sponsored and or internationally sanctioned techniques and practices of construction and destruction that fueled monuments survival and to situate them at the fault line between modernism and historicism. All the sites in this book once forced designers to make a decision between building and destroying, between monument, document, instrument and so on, and they demanded that historians do the same with their narrative choices. They show us modernity being constructed through intense committee negotiations over a period of intense destruction. They uncover that bureaucratic paperwork and design innovations were equally necessary for monuments' shape, form, outline, longevity, material composition, spatial disposition, in short, their architecture, to be understood as modern. Monuments in this book are not stable objects, but building projects. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.